Thank you so much, Omar, for your kind introduction and Igor for uh, inviting me in this session. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, I think one of the biggest disclosures I need to tell you is that history was always the worst class uh, for me through college, and uh, so so bear with me here. Um, uh, so I'm going to tell you I'm, I created a little timeline of uh, hernia uh, history. So um, we have known about hernias; they've been recognized uh, as a problem since the Egyptians in 15 uh, in 1500 BC. Um, so in the 1900s uh, is when we first started uh, hearing about mesh. Uh, and this was when mesh was essentially a silver wire uh, braided weave. Um, then after that, uh, the first time component separations were mentioned were, was in 1951. Uh, then uh, Reeves and Stopa essentially uh, coined the term that I'll discuss a little bit later, but the Reeves-Stopa repair essentially uh, was first recognized for enforcement of inguinal hernias and fixation of inguinal hernias. Uh, then uh, we had some ventral hernia and paniculectomy combos in 1977. Uh, Chevrel describes the onlay uh, in 1979. Uh, and then uh, Reeves and Stopa retrorectus repair, and this is for the abdominal wall defects, which we will talk about here uh, very soon. Uh, so a little bit more now focused on component separations. Uh, Ramirez with the external oblique release uh, and uh, posterior components, uh, posterior release of the posterior sheath. Uh, LeBlanc now with uh, lap ventral hernia. Uh, then we have Stopa that describes laparoscopic TEP. And uh, then we have robotic ventral hernias uh, being started, uh, Milburn laparoscopic component separation techniques, and then Abdallah with the robotic component separation. I know that some of these may be very controversial, and that's why I included a whole list of references if you guys want to go through this and become uh, quite a historian. Uh, but um, I do want to mention and just kind of focus on this a little bit. Uh, the the Reeves Stopa, and my understanding is that uh, Dr. Stopa was a student of Dr. Reeves, so a lot of the contributions were made uh, together uh, with them working together, um, and some of the history talks, uh, Igor gave an excellent history talk yesterday, uh, but it was just a very interesting concept of actually placing a mesh in a retromuscular or a preperitoneal space, and that's really what started it all. Um, so now when we talk about reeves stopa repair, when I talk to my residents, what I'm referring to is taking this posterior rectus sheet down, uh, closing that, and then placing the mesh in this uh, posterior uh, retro rectus space uh, a little bit like this. Um, and then your mesh lays just opposed to the rectus muscle, but you don't uh, dissect b uh, beyond the semilunar line. Um, so, um, interestingly enough, uh, the first uh, mention, so the first Hernia Society meeting, America's Hernia Society meeting was in 2002. Uh, this was in Tucson, Arizona, and there was only one lecture on component separation. It was from the Netherlands, uh, and you can see here component separation under quotations. If you look at their abstract, it's very interesting, but uh, the last uh, statement says, further research is needed to reduce the relatively high reherniation rate. Uh, you speed forward uh, to March 15, 2018. This is just uh, a month ago at the America's Hernia Society in uh, Miami, and we have 22 lectures on component separations, many of those including robotic, laparoscopic, uh, and a lot of things that you're going to see in this session today. Uh, if you're interested in hernias, you can essentially travel the world. We've seen representatives from all over the world uh, here, and there's a hernia society essentially on every continent. Um, I do want to share with you a little bit about component separation since I really think in the last 20 years this has been uh, the, the biggest uh, innovation in hernia repair. Uh, one of our um, research fellows, Michael Arnold, uh, presented this at the Academic Surgical Congress recently. And he looked at the NIS database uh, and uh, reviewed the uh, last 10 years of component separations. So what we saw is an increase in component separations. Still, even in 2014, only 10% of ventral hernia repairs are being done with a component separation, but it's a significant increase from back in 2005 when it was only 2.6%. Um, so uh, if you look at our patients and the comorbidities, uh, a little bit older, we're operating on less smokers now. Uh, we have, uh, we're operating on less diabetics, but they are a little bit more obese. Now, if you look at all the complications, I think this was uh, very interesting. Even with the increase in component separations, uh, that wound complications, minor complications, major complications have decreased over this time. So we're ups I think we're definitely doing something right. Uh, you know, and these meetings, I think, will prove uh, that we're onto something as far as 
figuring out what kind of meshes to use, what kind of techniques to use to improve. Um, there are a lot of different options uh, for repairing a hernia. When I was a resident, there was maybe just very few options, and this really didn't, you know, uh, it didn't really, um, uh, it wasn't a hard decision-making process. Now when you see patients, you have all these different options, where you're going to place the mesh, what kind of technique you're going to offer to the patient, and looking at all the risk factors that you can maybe modify prior to surgery and during surgery. Um, if, and uh, looking at literature, trying to figure out what the best position is for a mesh. Uh, uh, Mike Liang uh, did a very nice review looking at 21 studies, almost 6,000 patients. And the sublay repair, which is C right there, uh, seems to have done the best as far as recurrence rate and surgical site infection. And I think that's what you're going to see from the speakers today, uh, essentially emphasizing and, and doing all the different types and methods of uh, getting into that sublay position. So who should we use mesh in? I'm going to switch now to evolution of mesh. And uh, I think basically there is a lot of evidence that we should be using mesh all the time and essentially every hernia that we repair. Um, I can't talk about uh, mesh repair without mentioning uh, this uh, Lewandijk study uh, and prospective randomized trial and then uh, looking at long-term uh, results, uh, follow up uh, six years, uh, basically significantly reducing the risk of uh, hernia recurrence when you use mesh. Uh, what is uh, even newer data, so this was just recently uh, from Lancet, hot off the press, uh, using mesh in essentially even the smallest umbilical hernia defects. Uh, patients who have one to four centimeter defects uh, in this study from the Netherlands uh, did a lot better. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence, especially for the big hernias, when even the really small hernias uh, don't do as well without uh, mesh repair. Um, in neighboring Denmark, uh, this was an interesting paper that came out, uh, basically warning us about using mesh because of all the complications. So there's always a flip side uh, of, the, of the equation, and that's something that we really need to look at very care carefully because the, they essentially said maybe we shouldn't use mesh because it's such a huge problem. Um, there are a lot of advantages, disadvantages. Uh, Sam Ross was one of our fellows in the lab, and he put this together uh, looking at different occurrence rates, uh, surgical inside infection, and just really looking at primary repair, if you just do component separation, or if you do a mesh and reinforcement, which is something that we most of the time uh, do in our practice. Um, there are a lot of different options for mesh, and I'm going to just try to go uh, through a lot of different classes here. Certainly, there's not enough time to go into depth. Uh, but uh, polypropylene mesh has been around since 1959, um, and uh, there are a lot of different synthetic meshes. I think uh, most people uh, accept that polypropylene is a good synthetic uh, option. Uh, we um, used to use a lot of lightweight mesh. I think some of the data now, I'll show you, this is uh, from our lab, Dr. Blair, who uh, published a paper looking at lightweight versus midweight mesh, and this has really uh, changed our practice. We used to use a lot of lightweight mesh, now we use midweight mesh because of the decrease in uh, hernia recurrence. Uh, this study was essentially uh, showed the exact same results uh, in uh, the Greenville Hospital System with uh, Will Cobb and Alfie Carbonell. Uh, so I think when using synthetic meshes, uh, a polypropylene mesh that's a midweight mesh, uh, it seems to do uh, uh, the best from all the data that I could compile. Uh, now, what is the problem with synthetic mesh? We've heard about it at this meeting and many other meetings. Uh, a lot of these meshes could get infected. As our patients are getting more comorbid, this is becoming uh, much more uh, difficult to treat. And uh, what we have come up with now are absorbable synthetic meshes. They've been around for a while using for orthopedic fixation devices, hernia attacks, et cetera. And uh, the thought behind using uh, these absorbable synthetic meshes is that uh, we implant them and uh, they're around for a while until that patient heals. And then they essentially disappear and hopefully will not uh, create any problems uh, downstream. Uh, Vicryl mesh, uh, about uh, 20 years after polypropylene was created, uh, Vicryl mesh was created, and uh, there are a lot of uh, different biosynthetic meshes. These are just the four that I want to mention here. Um, and uh, there are various studies uh, with all of these meshes, no, not enough time to cover all of them. I do want to mention the COBRA study, uh, which really, um, it's, it's an excellent trial, uh, a lot of uh, excellent surgeons who participated in it, and uh, these were really high-risk patients who received uh, this uh, particular biosynthetic mesh. 
and looking at their 24-month uh, follow-up, 17% recurrence rate, certainly in this high-risk group, is uh, a very successful uh, repair. Biologic meshes, uh, there are uh, just as many biologic meshes out there in the market. Uh, they are processed differently. They come from all different kinds of animals and uh, different parts of animals, uh, so you can certainly uh, read and study about all of these, uh, and there are a lot of studies uh, that will tell you about it. Um, I just want to pull this one study from uh, Dr. Butler at MD Anderson, where a lot of these patients were very high risk, uh, so if you're going to study these uh, biologic and biosynthetic meshes, you really want to look at the high risk population. And uh, most of these patients had adjuvant chemotherapy, a lot of clean, contaminated, and contaminated or infected wounds, and with his five five-year follow-up, they only had an 8% uh, recurrence rate. So I think that uh, there are a lot of different alternatives depending on your patient population. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any guidelines at this point. The Ventral Hernia Working Group uh, does uh, give us uh, some sort of a guideline, but nobody uh, tells us what type of mesh to use in which situation, and that's something that's uh, a decision that we have to make in the operating room um, every day. So uh, in conclusion, I uh, would just say uh, be very careful as far as adap adaptation of new techniques and your mesh selections, and most importantly, uh, just follow your patients. Thank you.